Welcome to Speak the Devil Presents Third Side Perspectives. My name is Reverend Campbell. Uh, we have a great show for you set out for today. Unfortunately, we are missing one of the co-hosts. Now, we're hoping it's just a time mix-up. Best case scenario, that's what it is. Uh, we've reached out in every possible way that we have available to us. And um, I just now got a message. So let's see if we can get this rolling. If you guys will be uh, patient, uh, it'll just be a moment.
Uh, thank you all so much for your patience. Uh, we have everything set up as, as best as we can right now. Uh, I want to thank all of you for jumping in the chat so early and uh, for your attention. This is going to be a good show today. In fact, um, I'm going to be honest with you about the show. And perhaps this is the most honest way of looking at the issue as a whole. I personally find the idea of owning another human being repulsive. If you can't get another human to willingly act in your self-interest, you're a shitty magician. But more so, we're all living in an America that has benefited immensely from it. Now, I'm not talking about southern field hand slavery, though they did. I'm talking about the men and women who built this country. The immigrants that were coerced and forced to work off their debt of the immigration. The men who built this country didn't have days off, vacations, TV, or air conditioning. They were slaves to the corporations and contractors who controlled their very lives. If it weren't for them paving the way for the Industrial Revolution, we would all still be farmhands. Most of us would be dead. And the only influencers wouldn't be on Instagram. They would be from the radio or a book that was passed down as an heirloom. Our wealth as a nation is in exploitation. The gadget you use to communicate with, the shoes on your feet, hell, the food that you're eating is more likely imported and priced just right due to the indigenous hardworking hands of slaves than not. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel bad about buying the most inexpensive version of a thing that you hope will fill that vacant hole deep inside you, that thing that you hope will make your peers go ooh and ah, and I'm not suggesting that by buying that meaningless trinket, you're somehow contributing to the problem, but you are, hell. So am I. And that's my point here. Slavery continues to exist. Because we look the other way. We know there are human rights abuses occurring right under our noses, and no one is free from that stench. We know that cheap goods from other countries are cheap for a reason, and we only care when it's time to make a social media post or perform a show about it. And how can we feel guilty when we're not the ones doing it? We're not the ones enslaving other humans or trafficking them. But that's the nasty bit. We are. Through our collective actions, we have voted for slavery time and time again, every time with our dollar. When you get your nails done or a massage, when you go to a restaurant or a strip club, not all of them, not even the majority of them, and there's the rub. See what I did there? We don't care enough to find out. Whatever the form the happy ending takes, we just lay back, curl our toes, and let it happen. We're the problem. And for some of you, well, you may have been able to claim ignorance, and until this very moment, I envied you. But you don't have an excuse any longer. Tonight's show is all about modern slavery, specifically sex trafficking. And I've got two fantastic co-hosts joining me for the discussion. We are still working on getting everyone up and running. No Our first guest is this evening is David Harris, Magister in the Church of Satan and the owner of Dave's Custom Media. His short film, Creepy sure. Bastards, starring Sonia Harcourt and Heidi Knights, is currently nominated for Favorite Fetish Short Film and the 2019 Fetish Awards. Thank you for joining us, David. How are you doing? Adam, thank you for having me, my friend. My pleasure, Good to man. Be. Good to be here. Our second guest is Jesse Dubai, a model, entertainer, and porn star who's been featured in more than 150 films. She performs all over the country and has been gracious enough to join us and talk about her industry and her personal struggles with being wrongfully accused and fully exonerated of sex trafficking. How are you, my dear? I'm doing good. I'm really actually happy about to speak about my experience and share this time with you guys. Well, I genuinely appreciate it. And for those of you joining us in the chat room, if you have any questions or comments, get them up there and we will address them as soon as we possibly can. Um, but because I always like to start uh, in, from a position of a shared understanding, I'm going to give you a little bit of definitions about slavery and sex trafficking just so that we all are on the same page. So slavery is the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons by improper means for an improper purpose, including forced labor or sexual well, acts, but apparently that fell off my radar. <laughs> and then sex <laughs> trafficking is virtually identical except for uh, performing specifically commercial sex acts. And in the United States, that means specifically anyone under 18, whether they agree with it or not. Um, and so... If you guys are okay with it, I would like to start um, with how we justify living in the world with slavery. And then let's talk about some slavery facts before we dive in specifically to your story, Jesse, and sex traffic in general. Is that all right? 
works for me. Awesome. So, sure. David, um, I'm going to tee yes. you up here. How do we justify living in a world with slavery when we benefit from it in ways? Um, we, we ignore it. Yeah. It's, that's, that's the plain and simple truth. We ignore what we do. We, we ignore the past. We ignore what happens now um, because we like cheap shit. Yeah. And, and it's, there's really no other reason. There's no other. It's hard to come out and say and expound upon that because, in my opinion, it's just it's really that simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's no there's no other explanation other to that. We don't even think about it. We turn a blind eye, as you said during the intro, and we continue to engage and indulge in the things in this world that we'd like to get because they're cheap at yeah. the expense of whomever is making it. Can I ask you, Jesse, how do you square um, this idea as well with not only benefiting from there actually being, you know, cheaper objects or food because of slavery um, in one form or another and still having this idea of individual autonomy and, and being free to make your own choices in life? The way I see it is I take my power back mm -hmm. in the way of like, like I told you, you know, going into the sex industry or the adult industry, you know, it was, I don't know, something that came my way yeah. instead of, you know, having a pimp that will, because you always get that, you know, especially now with the new law that passed that got rid of Backpage and all of those um, web pages, there's tons of pimps out there, you know, telling you that. They have clients that, you know, they can manage your booking and all that stuff. For me, immediately, that's like a red flag. It's like, okay, you want to control me. You want to dictate me and, you know, take my heart earned money. Mm -hmm. I took my power back since the, I took my power since the beginning. I was like, if I'm going to be doing this, if I'm going to be in the adult industry, it's because I want to. It's because I choose to. And it's because I know what I'm doing. Yeah. If I would have. I feel like if I would have had someone, you know, like force me into the adult industry or if I was dating someone that was pushing me towards going to the adult industry for one way or another, that it was not something that I wanted. I don't think I will be in the industry. I'm mm -hmm. too much of, um, I don't know, tough cookies say it, that I don't let people mandate me, dictate me, yeah. you know, and I think that's, that's where like the human traffickers take advantage of their victims when they're vulnerable, when they're, you know, when they're at their lowest. Mm -hmm. And some people, we don't want to see that and we don't reach out to help the people that, you know, could fall into this situation. We, like you said, we just ignore it. We just turn, turn our, you know, heads yeah. around yeah. and expect that it goes away. Well, let me go through some um, facts and uh, myths about slavery um, while we're here. And just to give some uh, general ideas for people, because to be quite honest, when I started looking into this conversation, it was brought up in a, a previous show months ago. And it's just sort of been in the back of my head that slavery is a real thing still and that it's very, very prevalent. And I didn't think the reality is behind how prevalent it actually is. Uh, so the myth is that it only happens in developed worlds. Um, that's not true. It happens in literally every single country, including the U.S. Um, if you look at this statistical data here, uh, clearly it's uh, much more prevalent in Africa, which I think is not a surprise to anyone. But Asia in central, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, the EU and Europe in general, that's much higher than I would have thought um, that it's just a common occurrence nowadays. Like this is 2016 data that we're looking at. Uh, so another myth is that sex trafficker, uh, trafficking accounts for most of the cases, and that's just not true. Most of it is in agriculture, fishing, construction, manufacturing, mining utilities, and domestic work. And that I think puts it into a, a lot broader of a perspective because if you don't happen to watch pornography or you don't um, visit or, or entertain any adult industries, well, then you may not even think this is going to affect your life at all. But the reality is, is it affects everyone, no matter what you do, because you are in some way contributing it, whether it's a dollar, whether it's uh, being a victim of it, or whether it's uh, supporting it uh, through doing nothing, uh, the absence of action. Uh, and just looking at this, I think it's interesting. Forced marriage is uh, the second 
largest form of modern slavery. And uh, just south of me, I'm in Utah, and there's some fundamentalist Mormons that are uh, in trouble for this uh, for the past few years, uh, forcing children to marry into uh, these really creepy polygamist relationships. It's yeah, it's kind of it's kind of interesting that sex trafficking, as far as being compared to the overall global issue of modern slavery, mm -hmm. is so far down on the list, yet it gets the biggest headlines. Yeah. Um, you know, Faustus has to obviously the whole takedown of back page, you know, something that I railed about for a long time when that was first happening, um, brought a lot of that to the forefront. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you're absolutely right. The large majority of people who are, you know, being unfortunately enslaved are being forced into general labor, mm. domestic labor. Um, it's got nothing to do with sex, and yet sex trafficking far and away is probably the only form of slavery that's garnering any kind of headlines that anyone's trying to raise any kind of awareness about. And the sad part of that is, in my opinion, is that it has nothing to do with the people that are being enslaved. They're much more interested in going after independent working girls and, and independent prostitutes. They're not actually interested in solving the sex trafficking problem. Um, they've actually made the sex trafficking problem worse with Fosta Sesta because now they've they've pushed they've pushed prostitution back into the underground. Girls girls were running their own businesses. Mm -hmm. There were pimps were going away. There was no this it wasn't you know girls were really taking control of their own business and now with the internet being having having that marketing platform cut off at the knees thanks to Fausta Sesta a lot of girls are going back out on the street a lot of girls are turning back to pimps like Jesse was talking about you know pimps just showed up hey i got clients here let's let's do some business and girls are finding themselves in unfortunate positions again they're they're adding to the sex trafficking problem that they claim to want to solve Mm -hmm. May I add a little comment to yeah, yeah. your uh, thing? Mm -hmm. um, well, let's see. With the postesta and, you know, the law that passed, you know, I believe that what ended up happening, it was just worse. Um, instead of helping the, adult, the, the girls that they're claiming so much to save, they even made it worse. In my experience... When um, the person that, when I was accused of human trafficking, um, they found my victim because she was posting on Backpage. Hmm. So if, if, she, if the girl would have not been posting her pictures on Backpage, she would have never been found. So that's just like one, you know, aspect of it. Backpage, yeah, you know, it was a advertising service, but at the same time, you all you had to do was just go into the websites find the pictures, make an appointment with the girl, go and rescue the girl. Hmm. So now that all those girls are out in the streets, now that all those girls are like locked up in an apartment with a black guy, you know, at the door waiting for clients to come in, how do you save those girls? How do you know where they are? How do you go and tell them, I did something for you, when all you did was pretty much get rid of their income, their income source and now you're putting them at even more danger. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I got to ask, because in the chat room, they're saying uh, it needs to be legalized. Would, in your opinion, legalizing prostitution all around the world solve the issue? Um, what do you think, Jesse? It would solve it, but it will also suck it up. Look what happened with the, uh, the, with the cannabis industry. It was a good business. I love cannabis. Mm -hmm. But now that the government, you know, made it legal and stuck their little fingers in it now it's everything is changing though the strengths are changing it's like you know they want you to get high but you need to smoke a lot in order to get high i believe that if it becomes legal there's always going to be another problem that either we are the ones that we're paying the most taxes out of everyone or we're gonna have to like you know sign up and like I don't know, how do you say, um, register as an right. adult performer and for the rest of your life, oh, I'm registered as an adult performer. What if, you know, tomorrow I don't want to be a um, performer anymore and I don't want that in my record, like my legal record. Mm -hmm. I think it'll solve things, but it will also affect. Will it be a good idea? Yes, because 
girl, working girls, all they want is to make their money. Mm. All they want is to put a roof over their heads. All they want is to pay for whatever it is that they need to pay these days. You know, they're not, they're not out there, you know, freaking robbing people. They're out there working, hustling. It's the people that is behind those girls that need to be, you know, they need to be cut down, like the pimps and, mm. you know, the, the guys that ma- control the, the girls. Those are the problem. Yeah. There are uh, an estimated uh, 40.3 million people that are in slavery, uh, according to 2016 data, and 4.8 million of those are in forced uh, sexual exploitation areas. Um, and this generates approximately $150 billion in uh, illegal profits every single year. Now, that's all slavery uh, combined, so 4% of that, um, for uh, sex trafficking. It puts into perspective, um, for me, a a little bit of the realities of it. Because even though, um, uh, and I don't want to, this is this is a difficult difficult conversation for me because I'm coming from a position in my mo- opening monologue where I'm talking about slavery in general and us benefiting from it. Um, I f- do genuinely feel like it's a different scenario when it's sex trafficking. Um, I, I don't I don't know, uh, and this is maybe a little unfair, David, because I'm going to softball it over to you. But do you see a difference in approach in the benefits of traditional slavery when it's far removed in history or far removed geographically than knowing that there are probably sex trafficked women and men uh, down the street, presumably, you know? It's it's a difficult distinction to make because obviously you're comparing something that you know has happened both in the past and today to something that is a, a much more modern day problem which well actually no i take that back it, i'm sure it's not a modern i'm sure sex trafficking has been going on since time time in memoriam as we mm. say in the sex trafficking has been going on <laughs> since people have the yeah. time exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, i hear that's a relatively, relatively like new invention though so <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think there is a definite, a, a definite distinction in the sense that it's the double-edged sword that I was talking about earlier, where, you know, sex trafficking ultimately weighed down on the list in terms of the overall number of people that are just human trafficked, you know, either for labor or for domestic stuff and then versus sex. Um, but because we see sex trafficking so prominently in the media, um, you, of course, then see the victim impact. And the victim impact of any kind of sexual assault, any kind of forced sexual activity is devastating. It's, it, it fundamentally changes you as a human being. And then to witness that third hand as a, as a spectator um, obviously has an effect on you. So, it, so in retrospect, justifiably, people are going to be up in arms about it when they do see it because it has this tremendous devastating after effect. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I, I do think that it's warranted mostly because we, we see the devastation firsthand through the media, mm-hmm. through the eyes of, of our, our own, you know, our social media. Yeah. Well, Jesse, can I ask you, um, would you be willing to share with us your personal experience with, um, before, um, I don't want to get into the, the, the legal setup as of yet, but just your introduction into um, adult uh, entertainment. Uh, because you were mentioning uh, when it was just you and I having a conversation um, about that entry. And I think that's interesting uh, because, you know, when we were just sort of candidly talking, it, it very much seemed like it could have been in our current understanding, the current definition, that you may have been sex trafficked. So, like, what do you think of Like, can you explain that process to us? Of course. Um, adding something to this, you know, so you guys can understand this. It didn't seem to me hmm. like human, uh, human trafficking. It didn't seem to me like I was being used. It seemed like I was being helped. Like, I wouldn't be able to do any of this if I, was, if I didn't have this person helping me. 
you know. What happened is, you know, when I before I became a Jesse Dubai the porn star, I was Jesse Dubai an escort. That's not a secret. And um, the person that I met, Jessica, uh, she was a very well known escort. Um, I wasn't, you know, working at the bar where I was working, you know, making enough money. So one day she took me to one of her clients. She just said, come with me. You know, like, there's this guy that I need to go see. We go, we hang out. I didn't have to do any sexual services. I just had to hang out there. And the guy was drinking and whatnot. Then she gives me money. And then she goes, like, this is for your time. I'm like, nice. I, I can do this. You know, that was like the hook. Yep. Then... As time went by, it was like, hey, we have an appointment. Hey, we have a clock. We have a, a show. Whether it was three in the morning, four in the afternoon, I had to be available. And if I wasn't available, I would not hear the end of it. It got, it started to get to the point that I was being like harassed, bullied, threatened over the phone, you know, by this person of, you know, that if I didn't win and I performed with her, if I didn't win and I did a show with her, you know, I, my family was going to know what I was doing. Um, MySpace was very popular back then. So she mm. said she was going to make a MySpace, you know, and out me in front of everyone. Oh, so all that put me so much fear that I kept doing it, you know, until one day I realized I had a talk with my dad and then he pretty much gave me my power back as in a way of telling me, like, you do what you got to do. But if you're going to do it, do it because you want to. And that's when I stopped calling her, stopped texting her, blocked her calls, and I walked away. But if I would have stayed, I mean, God knows if I will still even be here or if I'm in another city, you know, working for her. Mm -hmm. How old were you when you first started, if you don't mind me asking? 16. Yeah. I ran out of my house when I was about 50, three months before turning um, 16. Mm hmm I moved out. I started. I had a fake idea, of course. I worked to. I went to work at a bar, and that's where I met Jessica. And you know, things went on from there. I worked with her for like two, three years, until I was like, no, this is this is just like no. I I I'm I'm over the age of eighteen. I can do. I have a power now. I have a voice now, and people's gonna hear me. Mm -hmm. So then I just walked away. I started, you know, performing. I started doing my thing, and. Now that I think about it, you don't realize that you could be a target of or a victim of human trafficking or you don't realize you are a victim of human trafficking until like you see it from the outside. Like when mm -hmm. once you step out of the box, then you see the picture where you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Suddenly you find yourself you've been coerced and you didn't even realize it because it people are convincing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it, what, it's what we've referred to it in this church as lesser magic, yeah. um, used for a nefarious purpose. Um, and so, yeah, people are super convincing. They'll be like, eh, just come do this. Yeah, it's, yeah just hang out. Like, it, it, I've, that story is, is a common story mm -hmm. that from, from girls that I've, that I've spoken with. It, it, it very much mirrors how a lot of <coughs> girls get coerced into the business. Um, and yeah, that's trafficking straight up. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because the more you, I look into, uh, how people are typically brought into sex trafficking or just human trafficking in general is like, it's from friends. Like, it's not like they grab you on the street and they just shove you in a car. They groom you from like, first interaction. Like, What's that? All right to this i said it, i believe it's just like you know rape the statistics show you know statistics oh my god i sound so smart <laughs> statistics show that when someone gets raped it's always someone in their inner circle mm -hmm. no one is gonna come like out of the blue <laughs> from another state from another county and be like hmm i think i'm gonna rape you today right. of course not it's someone that it's in the circle it's someone that has been near that person for a while that's why you know the the dangers are so big 
just with this. It's not, oh, sometimes it's not even a pimp across, you know, the, the state. It's not a, 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 a pimp that is in another city. Sometimes it's just your best friend, Camilla, that lives next door, that she's mm -hmm. been an escort for one year, and now she wants, to join, she wants you to join in. As easy as that. You don't have to go that far. Yeah. Yeah, it's wild. Um, and in as much as that is a, uh, a common anecdotal story that we hear over and over again, uh, it could also just straight, you know, depending on the culture that you're raised in, it could be your family that pushes you into this. It could be relatives that do it. And, and it really comes down to meeting those sort of basic Maslow's <coughs> hierarchy of needs where if you need to eat, if you need shelter and safety you're virtually going to be willing to do anything. And that's why slavery is so predominant in our world, even to today. It's because there is a need for labor in some form or another, and there are individuals who are in terrible circumstances or they're groomed into terrible choices. Uh, and, and that's what I think is so interesting about it, is that you know, as, as a young child, you don't necessarily have the... That, well, first and foremost, from a biological side of things, your brain's not even fully developed. And so to be able to expect a child to understand what's going on is irrational, illogical. They don't understand that they're being groomed. They don't understand that they're being exploited, especially in the sex industry. Um, they think they have something that they can make money off of, so why wouldn't I make money off of it? And by every definition, whether it's uh, local United States or international definitions of sex uh, trafficking, Consent is irrelevant. It doesn't matter if you're okay with it. The fact is you're underage, and that's what I think is so interesting. Can we talk a little bit about the changing times? Because let's be honest, age of consent varies from country to country, even within the states. It varies from state to state. And so how are we supposed to have this solid understanding of sex trafficking for anyone 18 and under uh, being a crime when we have states that allow marriage for 15 year olds like if that's not forced marriage like but it's legal like what do you think about that david um as an anecdotal story um one of <laughs> when i was doing radio upstate new york there was a there was a dj i know a dj i knew um he was in his mid thirties and his wife was 15 mm -hmm. and her parents signed off on it and she was in love. And it was one of those weird where it, it, everyone signed off on it. And I, I'm like, I don't get this. <laughs> it wouldn't be my kid. Um, whatever, man. Um, obviously forced marriage which occurs a lot, like you said, you know, in your neck of the woods out in Utah and, and in other factions of, of the various Abrahamic yeah. religions, you know, Islam being very prominent, obviously other sects of Christianity as well, um, even Judaism, yeah. um, <clears throat> where girls are being forced against their will to marry some creepy old dude who they, you know, their family owes money to or they, they were exchanged for some, you know, a, a, a goat and a bale of hay or whatever, however the fuck it works. Two cows. Um, <laughs> two, two cows. Um, it's abhorrent yeah. and disgusting. And, you're, yeah, there's, there's no consent involved. You, the, this girl is basically being treated as a piece of property. It's the closest thing to actual owning someone as chattel mm -hmm. uh, that we've seen since 1863. I think that's an interesting point that you bring up, too, because when we typically think about slavery, we are thinking of owning another human being legally. And outside of the context of, uh, you know, child marriage, I do kind of see that in the same way of owning another human being, um, which is why I'm, I'm so sort of like on its face against it in, in any state, whether it's legal or not. Um, but modern day slavery is not about that. It's about uh, coercion, not ownership and that i think is a little bit more challenging because if you're if you're being coerced into slavery because of needs that you have or your family has uh, or, or just desire to escape uh, a war-torn country or something and you're being forced to pay off that 
coyote or, or whatever for their transportation, if you can get past that glorious wall of ours. Um, <laughs> you know, there's no consent there. You might as well be owned at that point because they're not letting you go. Like, you're going to be indentured forever, ostensibly. Yeah, right? you've literally been sold yeah. by, by your family to some creepy old guy. Ugh. I don't know. That, that's it. That's that's what that's yeah. what that's what is happening. Yeah, Jesse. There's no other. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sir. I was going to ask you what you thought about that when it comes to this, to this idea of if if you were a, a 15 year old girl, are you able to make a decision about getting into a marriage, even if it's legal? Like, are you are you emotionally adult enough? I am 30 years old, and I'm not emotionally ready. <laughs> Imagine what a 15-year-old girl that has no idea yeah. what she's about to encounter. And I'm a slut. I've been around the block. <laughs> so I know, like, if I were to get married, it's like, okay, girl, you did it all. You can settle down. Now imagine a girl that she has no idea what's out there to get all this Weight, because that's what mm -hmm. I see when when this these marriages, this weight on her shoulders now that, you know, she she's she belongs to someone like, mm -hmm. and it's so sad that like you said, we are, I like to call it programmed, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know we we are raised into believing stuff, it's like girls, you know, being raised to think that they're princesses and that you know one day they're going to meet the prince that they're going to marry and the guy is going to pay for everything that mentality is what puts girls to marry you know guys at young age or kind of like preparing them to like you said you know get married at a young age once you get married it's like this is what you wanted this is your goal mm. this is your purpose you get raped you're born you're raised you get married you belong to someone Period. There's no more of that. Yeah. Thanks and a lot, lot Disney. Girls... <laughs> huh? I said, thanks a lot, Disney. <laughs> All right? the princess movies. All the princess movies guide you to that. And what is it after the marriage? Nothing. Because literally, p girls don't see it. It's like, now you, in a way, it's like owned, you know, like yeah. you said, by, by, by someone, especially being so young. And if the other person is the one with the monetary, you know, support, then... You're, and you're just a housewife, you're owned. And yeah. I have no nothing against housewives. I'm also one, but you know, you know where I'm going with Yeah. Well, can I ask uh, you guys what you think about um, the, the industry right now, the adult film industry, because you're both steeped in that right now. Um, and David, I'll start with you. Do you still see the effects of sex trafficking today, or is it diminished, or is it really compartmentalized in regions, or...? Um, in my own subjective experience, um, if I've encountered it, it has not made itself aware to me. There's like um, a neon sign. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I mean, be, I, because, I mean, because I'm still by all rights and purposes, you know, a small independent producer, um, you know, a lot of the girls that I work with are, are in completely independent. They're on their own. They're running their own business and they all, they're all level-headed <laughs> They come in, they, you know, they, they'll show up at the scene, you know, we'll shoot the scene, they're cool as fuck, they're totally professional, they get their money and they go home. Mm. Um, and they're completely level-headed about what's going on. I've, they've, <coughs> at, at the level that I'm currently working at, it's not something that I see. I, you don't, I'm not, girls I work with don't have agents, mm. they're all running their own shit. Um, and so I have a feeling that as the business became more democratized, as the cost of entry into the adult industry lowered, you saw girls and small independent you know, producers like myself take control of their own business um, away from the people who might be trafficking girls into the industry. Hmm. Um, I don't know how, how it would be because of Je Jesse is you know, leaps and bounds beyond me in her career. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, so I don't, I don't, I can't speak to the, to the major studio experience, but at the level that I shoot at, I don't, I don't see a lot of it. No. And how about you, Jesse? Do you see, um, sex trafficking or, or signs of it still around today, uh, in, in your personal experience? I, I mean, 
there is no sex trafficking in the adult industry is the way I see it because everyone is there, you know, for one reason or another, but everyone is there, you know, legally, hmm. you know, you have to provide paperwork, you have to provide IDs, you have to provide, you know, tests and all that stuff. You have to do it willingly, you know, even if you're like, you know, if you don't, even if you don't want to do it that morning because you're tired, because you're mad, because you're something, you're still going there to work. Where I see the problem is companies, um, and sometimes even producers, or sometimes even um, the, um, I was going to say pimps, the um, agents of the girls. Example, I see it a lot when girls tell me, oh, I want to shoot with you so bad, like, or a movie will be so freaking hot. But my producer tells me that if I shoot with a trans girl, I'm not hired no more. Oh, my producer says that if I, you know, shoot with this, I, I won't get shoots no more. And that's how it's, they're controlling them. It's like, I don't think you can sell this. So you can't do this. You can't do that. You can only do this. You can only this, do these kinds of things. And guess what? I just booked you a, you know, 25 black guy gangbang. You're going to get paid this much. Oh, okay. Hmm. But no, you can't work with the trans girl, even though it's something she wants. Right. That's what I see the, not the trafficking, but like the abuse or the trying to take the girl's powers from them. You do this, you don't get to work with me no more. Yeah. Well, I think that's interesting because that leads us into the next idea, I think. And that's, you know, we were talking about underage trafficking. Okay. But there is very much a control aspect, the, the autonomy of self. And, you know, if, if you want to be able to perform in X film or in, in any way, wh why would anyone else have a say in that? So is it just, is it, is it major, major, I'm sorry, blah. Is it primarily producers that are making that call? Is it the companies that are making that call for you? Like, well, it's the it's it's pretty much they don't you you don't come into play until the movie is already built. Right, I right. guess you know they have this idea of like we want this kind of girl. This girl is going to be you know bending over like this, and we want to see this certain thing, and we want her to wear this. They build all of that stuff up in their heads. They come up with the script and stuff. Because I have some scripts that I can show you. <laughs> and later the girl comes, you know. And it's up to the girl. Do you want to do this? She says, yes, perfect. Maybe she'll say, I'm not okay with this. I'm not okay with that. And a lot of, I like in my case, a lot of the companies that I have worked with, if there's something I am not comfortable with, we can leave it out. Doesn't matter if like the whole purpose of the movie was for the guy to come on my face. If I don't want to come on my face, they will work with me and they will move, you know don't work with me but i know companies and i know mm. producers that do not what did you just say what do you mean he can't come on your face that's what you're getting you you got hired that's why we got you if you can't do that let us know so we can hire someone else yeah and that's when the girl she's like oh okay no don't don't worry uh he can come on my face yeah. even though she doesn't want to interesting it's all kind of like you decide you know mm. i mean you 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 have a yes and you have a no, you know, if you say yes, deal with it. And if you say no, know that you can, there's going to be consequences. Maybe this person won't work with you, but there's other companies that will work with you. Right. Well, can I, could, would you be okay transitioning into uh, your experience with being targeted as a sex trafficker? Of course. Um, it's a very two year story. Yeah. Two year long story, so gonna show it up. <laughs> so everyone get um, comfortable. <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna be here. Popcorn out. Be popcorn out. I'll, I'll be like this. I'll be like, so <laughs> it was once upon a time. Yeah. It ends as a princess one. story. <laughs> <laughs> like we're reading the uh, book to a child. No. So in 2016, I met with a uh, 16 year old uh, African American girl that came to me um, to work as a prostitute mm -hmm. or wanted me to make her a website. Now, intentionally, my intentions were none of that. My intentions were to help an escort become a porn star. When I realized that after like uh, some time, actually within 30 minutes of my conversation with this 
girl that I was introduced to by an old friend that was my driver when I used to go to school, I realized that she is just a girl trying to become an escort, trying to build a website and get clients. I immediately, I saw the fear in her eyes. So I could tell like, this is not okay. Like, this is not something I want to be messed with. But I also felt like she needed help, you know? So mm -hmm. I didn't know how to tell her. So I just gave her phone numbers of, you know, the woman's uh, homeless shelter. I gave her numbers for um, um, women's associations here in Colorado that will help her, you know? That was up to her. She didn't call. One year goes by. I'm traveling, having so much fun around the country. <laughs> when I'm in New York, I get a call from my assistant saying that the FBI is at my house. Literally, my blood dropped to my feet. But I was wondering, what do they need from me? Like, how can I help them? I never thought I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. I immediately said, they need me. What do they need? So I cut my trip short. I come to back to Denver. The next morning, I get summoned to testify at a grand jury. Once I go, um, I couldn't even get a lawyer or anything because the appointment, was, the summoning was for the next day at 8 in the morning. So where am I going to get a lawyer in three, four hours? Yeah. Um, so I get there. I had no fear. I knew I didn't do anything. You know, when you have that confidence, I walked in like nothing happened. Apparently, um, as soon as I walk in, the persecution twisted everything against me <laughs> because she knew I was a porn star, of course. So she made me introduce myself not as the legal way you would, you know, like, hi, my name is so-and-so, and I am model, uh, award-winner actress. That's what I said. She didn't like that. She wanted me to specifically say, my name is so-and-so, and I'm also known as Jesse Dubai, porn, transsexual porn star. Mm -hmm. Because she needed that word, where she goes, ah, porn star. That's the word I wanted you to use. Yeah. Now, you being a porn star, have you ever received money in exchange for sexual purposes. So <laughs> you're like, we are, uh, <laughs> I'm a porn star. So <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, well, and I was like really sassy for people that knows me. I'm a fucking sassy bitch. So I didn't give her like a yes or a no. I was like, this bitch wants to get me. I'm going to get you back. You don't, you know what I don't did, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't, like, but I just act like I do. <laughs> well, you said dumb. <laughs> okay. There you go. Okay. So, I told her, you know, I, I'm like, well, if you're implying that if I commit prostitution, no, I don't, ma'am. I do get paid to have sex in front of the camera for a paying check that gets taxes deducted that pays your salary. <laughs> so maybe yes, but prostitution, no. And then she just, everything that she kept throwing at me, I kept like saying, that's what you're saying. My words are the following just in order to make me look bad in front of the grand jury. Mm -hmm. At the end of that, it broke my heart when I found out that I go, I call a lawyer, I look for a lawyer that whole day, the next day the lawyer calls me and he tells me that the grand jury came back with an indictment of 19 charges. Damn. And it, they all range from human trafficking of a minor, pandering of a minor for sexual purposes, conspiracy of helping a minor to commit illicit activities. You know, anything that it was in the book, she threw it at me. They had no evidence. They had no calls. They had no money transfers. They had nothing against me other than my own testimony that they used against me because I was a porn star. Mm -hmm. Because in their mind, they said, oh, you were an escort at one point, so you're going to escort her. Oh, you're a porn star now, so you're going. You're you're starting to escort people. So you're the. You, you, they thought I was the madame. They right. thought that I was like. So, and it was like a 15 person escorting ring, that I was you know met, uh, thrown into, and all of them. They all were getting like five to ten years. Five to ten years. I was looking at 50 to 60 in Holy prison. Holy shit. And I kept asking for my evidence. I kept asking for, like, tell me what you have against me. Yeah. Did not good. At the, like, the three courts before we ended up having the um, trial, because I went to trial, um, 
she couldn't even say anything. Like she will open the book of law and then she will say, well, according to section so and so and so and so, and then she will flip the page and then just read from there. And then I'll be like, aren't you here to charge me with something, say something about me? You have nothing, like absolutely nothing. Mm. The, even the, ju the, the, the judge was looking at her like, and what does that have to do with Christmas? <laughs> like, why are you trying to do just buying time? Do you feel like they were trying so, to make an example of you? They were just they, using you I, to make a point? I don't think, I do believe that they were using me to make a point, but I also believe that she was using me to give herself a higher name. Because he was not going to have the same ring in the news saying, once again, we capture five black men prostituting another black female. It's already done. But when they say we capture and with this man, Jesse Dubai was running the escorting ring where we saved a 16 year old girl. Boom. Right. That is catchy. And now you said this, this took place in New York, you said, correct? Uh, no, here in Denver, Colorado. I live <clears> in Denver. Denver. Okay. So this happened in Denver. So and at the time that that was going on, there's black election. people in Denver. <laughs> just yes, I know. Just a lot of my black brothers are here. Totally just kidding. <laughs> so, you know, that's like something that happened. So they needed to add that to, like, my. Let's just you know add that to this. Right. So, when I saw myself in that situation first. I knew I was 100% innocent, but I didn't trust that the system because the system, it was what threw me in there. I gave them everything they needed. Mm -hmm. I gave them my phones. I gave them my email addresses. I gave them, they went through my house. I was so, you know, yeah. sure that, you know, I'm innocent. I have nothing to fear, but yeah. everything they found, they, they were able to twist it, to change it uh, around and make it seem like, you know, I, I told them that I had cameras and I had a, 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 a studio equipment on my house. Immediately, their first thought was, did you have the equipment when you met the girl? Did you record the girl? Did you make videos with the girl? Jeez. Like, where did all this come from? I just said, I just literally six months ago got a studio. Mm -hmm. This happened a year ago. So where is your sick mind <laughs> that you're trying to force me to go there? You know, that's what I like. That's what, like, they doth protest too much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, the grand jury that I had, it was like, well, it was like 10 people of them. They were like white hair and like super thick, you know, bottom, uh, bottle glasses. So imagine when I said the word vagina, they were like, <gasps> <laughs> bunch of pro clutching you know? douches. <laughs> exactly. So I was so scared. They threw everything at me. Long story short, the, they offered me a deal where they got rid of uh, all the 19 charges and only gave me two. That would make me look 10 to 15 years in prison. Oh, no, Damn. in jail. Ah, right. nothing. Walk in the park. <laughs> yeah. Now, the deal was this. And, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. When I when I saw this, I was like, oh, you got nothing on me, bitch. Let's dance. Yeah. Because she said, here is your, you know, the deal. This is what we offer you. And we get rid of, you know, all those charges and we'll leave you with two. Pandering of a minor for sexual purposes and possession of controlled substances. And I'm like, where the fuck did the possession of controlled substances <laughs> came from? They're just but, pulling shit out of a hat, <laughs> like fortune cookie. Yeah, it's, just like, it's an equivalent. It's like they look for a similar charge that will have the same weight. And I'm like, so if I stab you in the throat... It counts the same as if I stab you in the balls. Like, if I stab you in the arm, it's a less. You know, like, Damn. The fuck we, we found a loose pill in your purse. It's a Motrin. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's powder and it's white. Exactly. So when that happens, she says, but the, the only way you can get this deal is if you do not ask me for your evidence. That's when I was like, <laughs> oh, I can I sit head. down with this prosecutor at a poker table? <laughs> oh, oh, I would take her money. I'm like, <laughs> no poker face. Here you go. Have your deal. I don't need it. Let's dance. So the next morning, the next uh, week, it's when we set up for pre-trial, where basically she let 
the judge know that apparently my victim was was um, testifying in another similar case, you know, um, in another county, and she wanted to go bring the transcripts from that county into my case to see if they said anything about me or anything Man. like that. The judge said, I will grant you permission, but you don't have any more time. You have from today into the next Friday <coughs> to go get those evidence. Mm -hmm. That same day, she was like so desperate to get me, I guess. She went as soon as she was done with me. She went to Arapaho and picked Picking up. Picking knees up and just running. <laughs> yeah, she was like, bitch, we're going to get to you, you know. So when she gets there, for my luck or my bad luck or her bad luck, my victim was there. And they asked her, we are conducting a investigation against so-called Jesse Dubai. Mm. Can you please, can, will you help us? She said, yes. She said, can you testify against her? She said, no. She said, can you please tell her, tell us what she told you? And everything that I told her, this is not for you. Try to be safe. Walk away. Here's numbers of associations. I'm sorry I can't work with you if you don't have an ID. Everything that I have told them since the beginning is what she told them. Beautiful. And then they asked her, will you um, testify against her? She said no. At that moment, there were no charges against me. The victim defended me, and she said she's innocent. Mm -hmm. She has nothing to do. She tried to help me. I didn't listen. Yeah. Now the girl, she, by this time, she was like, what, 19, 19 years old, something like that. So, no, no, no. She was like <laughs> 17. Now she's like, when the, all this ended, she was like about to be like 19. Right. When my case, you know, got dismissed. That my charges were dropped. My um, name was cleared of all guilt. I was not even, you know, like guilty by association. Like I literally had nothing to do with it. Yeah. But the fact that they wanted me to be, you know, guilty of it, I can show you the papers, and I have a huge box like this, <laughs> that when I read the transcripts, like I told you earlier, mm -hmm. I believe that I'm that kind of person. I, they made me believe, because they use my words, but the way they twisted them and the way they, they rearranged them, they were my words, but it was not what I meant. Right. It just made me seem like I was this horrible monster they they portrayed me to be. So my experience in in that with that whole thing, it was like they made me doubt myself. They made me doubt my integrity. They made me doubt on the system. They made me doubt on my 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 my, my honesty. Like I was honest with you. I was a hundred percent truthful. I tried to help you. And all you did was try to incarcerate me for your own benefit. Mm -hmm. When you knew you had nothing on me, you still went ahead and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed, trying to get, you know, a shining star for your office when you knew there was no leads, there was nothing, you know. Using me as a pawn in your little, you know, log game is not something that I was counting on when I was fighting this, you know, case because you trust in the system you think that you know the <laughs> system is in place for a reason until you're in it then you realize right. how fucked up it is where someone can be charged of the two people can be charged with the same crimes but one gets double the sentence compared to the other right just based on the way they look where they come from um race age sexual preferences like, we're at the mercy of whatever is running the system. Government does not exist to serve the people. Government exists to control the people. Yeah. Just like but, the church. Yeah. People have, people have replaced their God with their government. Um, and quite often they will conflate the two. The government is probably the biggest trafficker of, of slaves um, in the modern era. Hmm. Are you um, talking about the caged children? I'm talking about I'm talking about them. I'm talking about forced labor camps when it comes to people that are in prison. I'm talking about private prisons. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. The, you know, you, you, that's free labor. Yep. What and is they that? use that's, them too. You're, you're, 
Yeah, you're being held. You're being held against your will because no. I mean, granted, you've committed a crime. You're serving your sentence, but now you're being compelled into forced labor. At the end of the day, that's fucking slavery. Mm-hmm. And it's horrible how many jails are open. Like so many jails. Are like I was reading. I I like when I was going through all of this, you know, case. I was seeing how many people give money to build new, you know, incarceration centers, you know, state-of-the-art ones, you know, and all of this is just for that, labor. We're going to, we, we, you, we don't think you belong outside in the society, so we're going to charge you with this, and we're going to take you to this jail because we need workers. You know, that's See, yeah, that, that. That's interesting to me because it, it brings it sort of, 360 degrees you know we're talking uh, about you know framing the conversation with we're benefiting from this horrible thing that we demonize as a culture and we're ending it with well the powers that be have allowed private prisons to exist for financial profit which means you have to have a population that's incarcerated for them to get profit the entire purpose of a corporation is to make money for its uh, board and investors, so they have a fiduciary obligation to do so, so we have to get new bodies in there. And what are you going to do with them when you can make a little more money and have them work or just have them sit on their ass? Well, let's have them work and let's uh, contract out uh, cheap labor. You don't have to pay them hardly anything, less than a dollar a day in some cases, in order to um, renovate uh, locations or, or build uh, foundations. I mean... It, we we're looking at this concept of trafficking collectively through a very narrow lens when uh david you just sort of busted open that door into governments forcing it yeah i kind i kind of do that <laughs> I, i've been known use kool-aid to man the door man <laughs> there is a all right everywhere you know when we think of human trafficking i mean just for even for the people that is listening to us, do mm. me a favor. Close your eyes and hear this word, human trafficking. Right. What comes to your mind? Immediately, I think of a child put, being put in a car to be sold by, you know, somewhere. Or right. immediately, I think of a prostitute that is being pimped out. Those are the immediate things that come to my mind. But we don't think about the other type of, um, you know, abuse and, you know, like you said, in a way named called slavery you know mm-hmm. being owned uh you know being trafficked for you know whether it's labor uh, services whether it's you know, sexual purposes you know still the same that it's a big broad brush that some people rather see it with just like a very thin it's just you know being trafficked and being sold you know for for sex you know when oh, yeah. it could be so much more the organ i mean you know, people that get kidnapped and their organs get, you know, sold and stuff. I mean, that's that's horrible. Yeah. That's a horrible, is, you know, human trafficking kind for me. Well, and there's there's like a realistic side of this that we have to face. I think uh, the majority of individuals, when they think of trafficking of human beings, uh, whether it's for sex or labor, they think of third world countries. But the truth is, the United States is a source and a destination for trafficking humans. Like, and it's not just the United States. I mean, Canada, South America, Central America. I mean, the, the Americas in general is, is a prime candidate here. And we export um, individuals as well uh, to places like the Netherlands, to Germany and Japan from the U.S. Uh, and some of the largest, this is a weird way to frame it, importers of sex trafficking uh, is like Mexico, Philippines, Thailand, Honduras, Guatemala, Indian, and El Salvador. I mean, if, if I, I'm not entirely sure, as Americans, we <coughs> afford the concept of autonomy of self to third world countries like we do to ourselves. We think, well, I'm an American, I'm in America, I'm free everyone else in a third world or second world country well you know it's kind of their fault they live there that's the american way hooray for me fuck you um <laughs> it's how we are there's no there's no two ways about it um we're very americans are very 
Amerocentric. There, there's even even in less right wing circles, there's a heavy thread of nationalism that runs through this country. Um, you know, everyone is everyone's proud to be an American, and sometimes rightly so. America, there's a lot of good shit here, um, a lot of bad shit here too. Um, and I think it's we shouldn't be afraid to call out that bad shit um, because it. At the end of the day, we should be able to openly discuss the things that are wrong with this country. We should be able to criticize our leaders. We should be able to question laws, question authority, because human beings are fallible. It is as evidenced by the fact that we can't seem to solve this fucking problem. Yeah. Um, where we, We've continued for... 200 plus years to turn a blind eye to the various forms of slavery in this country. It still exists. And until we're able to do that, until we're able to say, hey, we should really do something about that. Um, we're just going to continue to live in a hypocritical society. Yeah. And it's, I think, I think at this stage, Americans are comfortable with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, what do you think, Jesse? I, do, do you think collectively Americans are just, they're, they're okay with it in some way or another? I consider myself an American because I've been here since I was very little. So mm. I'm going to say yes when it's convenient to us. No right. when we want to make, you know, something out of it, whether we're against it or mm -hmm. whether we are, you know, you know, we have a personal vendetta, just like, you know, some political people that have it, right. that, um, example, uh, you know, po politicians, they, they're they saying, you know, with, with the stopping process that they're saying, you know, like, they're patting themselves in the back saying, like, we made a law that makes it illegal for websites to help pimps prostitute girls. Great, yes. But they're not saying we also made it really hard for working girls that are in this business to uh, put food in their plates. Now we actually exposed them to new pimps. Now mm -hmm. we actually don't know where to find the victims anymore because their pictures are not out there anymore. But don't worry. You believe that we did something good. So good for us. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean when it's convenient to us. It's, it's good optics. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It looks it looks good and does nothing. If anything, it made it worse. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's as good as it gets in this conversation, <laughs> unfortunately. Like, I, I'm not sure. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> it got worse. Because there's no real way to, to solve this when collectively... You know, we'll do mouse service, but when it comes to actually doing something about it, you sort of throw your hands up and you're like, well, what can I do? And now, there are international organizations that support um, legislation in different countries to help tamp down uh, uh, slavery in all of its forms. Um, and yes, I think we should absolutely explore that. And for whatever reason, uh, the tightening of restrictions of, that already exist is not fully adopted by everyone in our current uh, Congress, which is a strange thing. But if, if you want to uh, try to clamp down in your own personal way, reach out to your representatives, um, you should definitely be checking out... Um, uh, give me one second here. It's the uh, International Labor Organization's uh, proposal of H.R. 898 Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act uh, uh, policies. They actually make it so you don't prosecute the trafficked victims for their behaviors, which I think is probably the largest problem that we have right now because if you were trafficked, and you prostitute yourself, you're going to prison. And it wasn't a choice you made. It was something you were forced into. And now you're suffering consequences of something that you had no choice in in the first place. Uh, or you were literally coerced and Stockholm Syndrome believed that it's a good opportunity for other people like you. And so you bring other people in. But you, you were brainwashed to that position. 
uh, from having suffered from it yourself. And so there is pro there are proposals, policy uh, addendums that would, uh, if not completely uh, alleviate <coughs> repercussions for those that were trafficked, it would lessen the consequences of their actions uh, after they have become of age. Um, or repeating the behavior to others. So I think it's something worth exploring. And honestly, I don't ever see anyone giving up their cheap phones or their cheaper shoes. Like if we understood the actual cost of products in our world. Imagine paying five grand for an iPhone. Seriously. Like if you had to pay for every labor hand that helped make anything that you have bought in the past 10 years or your entire life, you would be just like every other past civilization of having a suit that you saved up for and you took great care of because other than that, you would have nothing to wear. It's, yes. it's insane to me. All right. So um, do you guys have any closing thoughts on the idea of sex uh, trafficking or slavery in general? Um, slavery is bad, okay? Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um <laughs> I mean, it continues to be a prevalent problem. Um, I would like to see, just my own personal edification, I would like to see more of the domestic labor and the forced physical labor issues with regards to human trafficking get some more headlines. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the statistics don't lie. You know, the vast majority of the people that are being trafficked are being trafficked into those industries. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, sex trafficking is, you know, while a, a prevalent and abhorrent problem, is further down on the list um pe and the people that are focusing on it in government are not helping they're making mm -hmm. it worse so do you know what you you, you fuck this up enough guys go work on a different problem <laughs> um that's all i have to say about that. <laughs> uh jesse do you have any closing comments on the topic any trafficking is bad don't fucking do it mm -hmm. be smart if you feel like you know someone is you know, in that situation, or someone is about to encounter in a situation like that, you know, reach out to them, help them, you know, don't judge them. Because sometimes at those times, spirit just needs a listening ear and a, you know, shoulder to cry to put up throughout the day. Mm. Not someone that's going to judge them and push them into it even more, you know. Yeah. Um, other than that, I don't know. Make love, don't hate. <laughs> oh, I would also like to say, uh, if you're wrongfully uh, or accused of crimes, fight. fight. Yes, don't fucking quit, bitches. Never fucking quit. <laughs> Trust yourself. And also, don't put... Now I tell myself this all the time when I wake up, like sometimes and I, you know, like do my makeup and stuff. It's like, don't put yourself in those kind of situations. Because mm -hmm. I could have avoided it, you know, like since the first conversation that I had with the, my friend at that moment, the Uber driver. But I didn't. I, like you said, you know, the conversation went on and I got caught into it, like convinced into it. If I would have walked away that day, none of none of it would have happened. Yeah. But I had to learn my lesson, and it was a uh, heartbreaking one. But it was a very good and tough one that made me a tough cookie and a smarter one. Yeah. Well, I think that's going to be the best way to close this conversation. Uh, David, can you let the good folks watching know where they can find you online? Uh, you can go to my website, davescustommedia.com. You can also follow me on Twitter, at davescustomxxx. Um, vote for Creepy Bastard for the uh, favorite fetish short film uh, for the 2019 Fetish Awards. Uh, link is in my Twitter. It's in the um, description of this video as well. Awesome. Yeah, vote. I think voting ends July 12th. Um, so you have it. until then. Vote yeah. Vote daily. Vote often. Uh, Jesse. I want a second trophy to go along with my first one. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. Uh, Jesse, where can the good folks find you online? Of course, just go to my website, D Jesse Dubai, or my Instagram, which is my favorite one, D Jesse Dubai, mm -hmm. or my Twitter, which is that, the port one, <laughs> which is at yeah. Well, definitely, uh, I highly recommend checking out Jesse online. Uh, some crazy hot stuff that she's doing. And uh, David is doing some amazing stuff uh, with his films, uh, especially if you're into fetishes. He's got all sorts of stuff there. So it's, it's really great. And go vote 
Let's get this man his well-deserved award, everyone. Thank you guys so much in the chat room for all your conversations and for joining us for this long uh, discussion. We appreciate your time and attention. And until we can speak of the devil again, everyone, hail Satan. Hail Satan.